Ah, the APU. The merging of the CPU and the GPU has always gotten my nerd juices flowing. I've embraced this kind of processor in my PlayStation 2 build here on the channel, and I'm just dying to see what RDNA 2 can do with an APU. Until then though, we managed to get our hands on the best APU yet, the 5700G. Now we've covered the GPU performance in another video, so today let's see if its cores can beat some of the better processors on the market. Hey guys, Turk here. I hope you're having a great day. Our previous 5700G video covered the APU's graphical potential with several games at 720p and 1080p. Overall, I find that this processor can drive esports and casual games at 1080p with relatively comfortable frame rates. We did see a few questions regarding the low quality settings in the comments section of the video, so let's fill in a bit of those gaps real quick. We see several games jump into that 30 FPS threshold, which might tide some users over during our current GPU crisis. But the GPU component of this APU is only half of the story here. There have been many improvements to APUs over the years, and fortunately for us, the jump from the 2400G to the 5700G nets double the core counts, faster frequencies, and a better overall computing experience. So, in today's video, we're going to be facing the 5700G against some of the best of AMD's parts and a popular offering from Intel. Now, we've reviewed a lot of processors here on the channel, and 8-core processors strike an outstanding balance between performance and value. When it comes to streaming and content creation, I find that 8-cores just provides better flexibility compared to some of the 4- or 6-core parts. Today, we are looking at AMD's 5900X, 5800X, and my personal favorite, the 3700X. As for Intel, we could have gone with the 11700K, but the 10700K, it seems like a better value contender compared against the 5700G. If you're curious how the older Zen-based processors could perform, I definitely recommend you guys check out my Zen 3 review up at the top. Taking a look at the spec sheet real quick, the 5700G rocks 8 cores and 16 threads of that Zen 3 architecture that we have come to know and love. However, we do see half the amount of the L3 cache when compared to the 5800X, which could come and bite us in the butt with the rest of our testing today. Boost clocks only lag behind by about 100 MHz, though the base clock speed it does remain the same. The 5700G also officially supports the same memory data rates as its bigger brother, though the only major omission with the 5700G is the lack of Gen 4 PCIe, which may or may not be a big deal for you. With all that said, it sure looks like this part is the 8-core little brother of the 5800X. Upon closer inspection, there are some excellent benefits of this little processor. The 5700G is rated at a TDP of only 65 watts, which is 38% less than the 5800X. And couple that with the integrated Vega 8 iGPU, this processor packs a lot of tech into a small package. And coming in at $90 cheaper than its bigger brother, that's a heck of a bargain. However, let's compare against the older Intel and AMD parts. The 5700G is a lower power part with the Intel, but it doesn't have as high of a boost clock speed. AMD's older part sports more L3 cache, but with lower clock speeds. Keep in mind, this newer part is also a bit more expensive, so either of these processors could still be a great value contender. More on that towards the end of the video. Since this is a standard CPU review in most regards, I will be throwing the 5700G into our AMD test bench with 32 gigs of DDR4-3200 at CL16. I'll also be arming this system with my RTX 3080, and I will be retesting the 3700X and 10700K for good measure. Now money is quite tight these days trying to snag those latest GPUs, so I have yet to purchase the 5800X. However, I can simulate its performance by disabling one core from each CCD of my 5900X and tuning power and temperature output as necessary. This simulated 5800X comes close to what several outlets report for their results in both applications and synthetic benchmarks. However, for transparency, I'm going to be labeling them as 5800X in each of the charts today, so keep that in mind. I can only pick up these parts with y'all's support, so hit the subscribe button and follow me over on Twitch. Now, it's chart time, and let's start off with some application performance. 
So I didn't cover all of the PC Mark benchmarks in this particular video, but I did want to cover the digital content creation. Now with video editing, it clearly favors the cores. However, photo editing and visualization appear to like both the frequency and the core counts. Overall, the 5700G is an upgrade to the Zen 2 chips, but it does miss the 5800X by about 4 to 5%. Single thread Cinebench results struggle slightly compared to our simulated 5800X, but the multi-core run does appear to be right on track. The 5700G performs on par with the 10700K and handbrake in both H.264 and H.265, but overall it falls behind by about 5 to 6%. Corona echoes the handbrake results, falling just 6% behind the 5800X. The latest APU enjoys the benefits of the Zen 3 cores, besting the 3700X by over 1,000 points in single-threaded performance within Geekbench, but falls considerably behind the 5800X. AMD's 12-core solution is the superior processor with the Luxmark OpenCL rendering. However, the 5700G is quite competitive with the 5800X, only losing by 4 percentage points. Here's where Zen 3 comes out on top, and the 5700G is light years ahead of the 3700X in POV Ray. It sadly beats the 10700K, but falls short of the dedicated 8-core processor. Similar to Luxmark, V-Ray shows very tight results across the 8-core parts, with only 14 percentage points separating the entire field. Intel manages to keep up, but the 5800X does manage to come out on top. If you're looking for Y-Cruncher dominance, I recommend going with Intel's 11th gen parts because they implement the AVX 512 instruction set. However, despite the extra cores and the cache, the 5900X just barely manages to sneak ahead of even the 5700G. With all the application performance in hand, the 5700G performs on par with the other 8-core chips on the market, and it only slips by around 5% compared to the $90 more expensive 5800X. Now let's do some gaming. Starting off with Ashes of the Singularity, the 5700G is on par with the older Zen 2 and 10th gen Intel parts, but the 5800X's extra frequency grant an additional 4 FPS, while the 5900X's cores and frequencies buy it 20 FPS. The 5700G finally stumbles in our comparison here in Call of Duty, which could be due to the smaller cache size. Regardless, it's still a decent competitor, pumping out over 120 FPS at even 1440p. Both of AMD's 8-core offerings stumble a bit with Crisis Remastered, but it still performs well in this title. It is interesting to see that the 10700K squeezes ahead and only loses to the 5900X by 7 FPS. Cyberpunk enjoys the extra frequency on all the competing processors today at 1080p. Fortunately, 1440p shifts the dependency over to the GPU, and the 5700G only really suffers from the 1% lows. Come June 29th, we'll be revisiting Doom Eternal with ray tracing enabled, but for now, the 5700G outperforms the older 3700X, but it falls just short of the 5800X and 10700K. However, 1440p turns the tables with 3700X pulling ahead. Regardless, it's hard to complain when ripping and tearing around 240 FPS. Our token racing game shows similar scaling results as we've seen today, with the 5700G slipping by about 14 FPS at 1080p and 8 at 1440p. However, that's only a 4 percentage point drop, which might be worth it considering the cost savings. Grand Theft Auto shows its classic CPU limiting nature here, with both resolutions showing similar results. Still, we're above 140 FPS. Interestingly, the difference between the integrated graphics and the RTX 3080 in this game is 129 FPS. So, is the upgrade worth it? I, I don't know why you're asking. Yes. <laughs> We've seen the move from Zen 2 to Zen 3 heavily favor the newer processors in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, but the 5700G unfortunately doesn't embrace that full IPC uplift that its brothers possess. Adding insult to injury, the 10700K performs about 6% faster. Let's pivot to more GPU-focused games for just a bit. I still haven't integrated Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition into my test bench, but the RTX 3080 in each of these instances performs well at 1080p. 1440p, though, does continue to show some of the pitfalls of the 5700G, whereas traditional 8-core parts can get identical performance. Swaying even further into GPU-limited territory, the 5700G performs just as good as any of the other parts in Red Dead Redemption 2, even at 1440p. Assassin's Creed Valhalla gives us some interesting results. The 5700G performs just as good as the 12-core 5900X at both resolutions, 
that the 5800X and 10700K squeeze by by about 6 FPS. The next few games, I didn't get a chance to run some of my older hardware through, so we're only going to be looking at the Ryzen 5000 series. With Hitman 3, we see pretty decent scaling at 1080p, but 1440p levels the playing field. Horizon Zero Dawn, though, shows excellent scaling across the processors and resolutions. The 5700G just barely misses 120 FPS at 1440p, which just shows you what a few extra megahertz can buy. Unfortunately, the gaming results leave me a little bit disappointed with this 5700G, but there are a few options available, such as PBO or faster memory data rates, to squeeze out even more performance. Regardless, the 5700G drives this RTX 3080 almost to its full performance. So, final thoughts about the 5700G. I think the 5700G is a pretty decent processor from a couple of different angles. The first is if you're going to be upgrading an older system with a 65 watt processor. Sure, the 3700X fits the bill as well, but with the 5700G, you gain a bit of extra frequency and those famous Zen 3 cores. However, you lose a little bit of the L3 cache and access to Gen 4 PCIe. It's also a bit more expensive, so either option might be a better fit for you. The more impressive approach is for people that are going to be building a new system in the GPU crisis of 2020. With the lack of GPUs at reasonable prices, the 5700G's built-in GPU might just be enough to tide you over until supply starts hitting store shelves. As we saw at the beginning of the video, if you're willing to compromise either the frame rate, the resolution, or some of the detail settings, some games can be enjoyable for just long enough until you get a GPU. Coupled with the 8-core performance only lagging by at, at most 10% across the application and the games, this processor in a budget build or a good pre-built system might give you some breathing room going into 2022. And given how well it drives the RTX 3080, I imagine driving a less powerful card would tighten the differences compared to other processors compared today. However, if you don't need the integrated GPU, the 3700X or 10700K are still viable options for 8-core machines. But suppose you're looking towards the future with PCIe Gen 4 for utilizing all the available bandwidth of the shiny new mythical GPU. In that case, there are other better, newer processors to put in a high-end system. 5800Xs are regularly available on AMD's site, and Intel does have less than ideal solutions for 8-core parts with their 11th generation hardware. Now, if you don't mind the speculation for a bit, what about the 5600G? I'd imagine it performs slightly worse than the 5600X, along with similar limitations as the 5700G. Coming in at $259, it saves $40 compared to the 5600X, making it even more of a competitor in the value build market. But I have my bias towards 8-core parts, so keep that in your back pocket if you watch any other videos here on YouTube. But that's a wrap for our 5700G coverage here on the channel. Let me know what you think. Should we update our PlayStation 2 build with this puppy or move on to greener pastures in our hardware escapades? Let me know down in the comments or over on Twitter at the Turk. As always, thank you for watching Turk Force. I hope you all have a great day.